to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today nearly live from Ottawa, Ontario. Great episode for you today talking about a new book in First World War history. It's called For Home and Empire, Voluntary Mobilization in Australia, Canada, and New Zealand during the First World War. And the book explores how in each of those three countries, people mobilized to support the war effort. And it really focuses on how these efforts reinforced class, race, and gender boundaries. The author, Steve Marty, who, who we're going to talk to today, really delves into how these localized efforts served to demonstrate who is included and who is excluded from various communities in all three countries. It's a really fascinating discussion because so often it gets presented as the war starts and it's this big national mobilization and people are enlisting and giving money and everybody does their part. But what this book does and what Steve does in his research is really try to tap into who is participating, why they're participating, and what are the larger effects of this on people's identity and their connection to their communities in Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. Really wonderful book, great ideas that really challenge some of the established narratives that exist within the historiography of the First World War. So that's what we're talking about today. I was very pleased to have Steve on the show. So without any further ado, let's get to that conversation. All right, it's Steve Marty joining us from Edmonton this morning. How are you, Steve? Yeah, good, thanks. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. Uh, looking forward to talking about the book. Again, it's For Home and Empire, Voluntary Mobilization in Australia, Canada, and New Zealand during the First World War. Now, before we get into the content of the book, though, I want to talk a little bit about your experience because you're somebody who has shifted to non-academic work. And I'm just curious what this process has been like for you. The book co comes out in the fall. It was clear to you that you were making this shift. So for a lot of folks, writing books like this are, are about academic work and, and getting promoted and jobs and all that kind of stuff. But here you are with this book whilst also making this career shift. Could you just talk about what that process was like for you? Because uh, it, it seems to me that it would be exciting in two different ways yet the two ways aren't necessarily related to each other. I mean, I think like a lot of people, you know, a big part of trying to get the book published was to make myself more competitive for academic jobs. And I think in the recent years after the PhD, it seemed like there was hope there, like I'd, I'd gotten a postdoc. After the postdoc, I, I managed to have a couple of phone interviews and an in-person interview. Um, so it seemed like there was there was some traction, and so um, you know I just kept thinking like, you know, getting the book out will will definitely help. I think after the postdoc, I didn't have much luck finding work as a sessional instructor, and I think further along I went, the the clearer it became that, you know, I didn't necessarily have the the research profile to get a job at a research heavy institution. And I didn't have the, the teaching experience to get a job at a, a kind of more teaching focused uh, institution. So it didn't really seem like a tenure track job was going to pan out. I decided to keep working on the book first off, first off, because um, I didn't have a lot of other work to do, um, but also just because I think there was a lot of work gone into this. And I think the, uh, the ideas that are raised in the book are worth putting out there. Um, and so I think that was one of the big things that kind of kept me going is just believing that, you know, somebody must find this book useful and interesting, and hopefully it will, it will lead other scholars to kind of look in, in, this, in these areas or, or at least shape the way that other scholars think about themes of, of, of mobilization in, in war and how settler colonies like Canada, Australia, and New Zealand um, operate in a different context than other imperial colonies. So that was really kind of what, what kept me going. And then, yeah, um, I had been offered uh, my non-academic job in August, and the book came out in, in October of 2019. And so by the time it came out, it was 
a bit anticlimactic for me just because I knew that it wasn't going to to lead to, to what I think it was meant to lead to. But I think I'm just glad that it's, it's out there in the world. Um, I'm not quite as invested uh, in promoting it uh, as much as, as some scholars are when they, their book comes out just because it's, again, it's not really meant to land me a job now. I think it's just out there existing, waiting for, for scholars who, who need to, or who, who might be interested in, in building on this later on. And so now it's, it's kind of more of like, I think a seed that I've planted and it's just out there and we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how I thought about writing a book when, when I wasn't sure what was gonna happen career-wise. Yeah, well, I, you, you touched on something that I think is important as, as someone who is also, I guess I still have a foot in the academic side doing some sessional work, but you know, my full-time form of employment is, is in non-academic work that knowledge for knowledge's sake is good. That, you know, writing a book, doing research that is of interest to you, that could be of interest to other people, that could be useful to the, to a discussion, like that's still worthwhile. Like, I don't think books should only be written when it's going to be used for a promotion within a university because if the only people who are doing research and publishing books are university faculty i think that is kind of problematic i really think that there is a place for people who are not engaged at the academic level to do their research to publish their findings in a in in a into a market that especially for military history there is a significant non-academic audience for it. So I, I really hope that as more and more people leave the field to go into other areas, into the non-academic job market, because that's just sort of the simple reality of where the job market is right now, I hope that there is still a place for them to, if they want to, do research, publish. Financially, the incentive might not be there in the same way, but I think a book like this certainly has its place. And even if career-wise, it doesn't have the impact that maybe it would have if you were involved in a, in a university, it still is a, a nice outlet. And there is opportunity for you to make money off of the book, which, I, I mean, you're not going to get rich off of a, an academic, a book published from an academic press in this country, but there is at least a little bit of a financial incentive to do it not to the again not to the extent that you're going to get rich yeah. probably not to the extent that it maybe even is worth the time when you do the math on it but there is something to it right yeah no i think like from the, the finances part of it i think a lot of it was not so much what i would make from it but what was put into it and who put the funds into it i mean at the end of the day yeah um you know a lot of the funding that supported this book came from uh, largely from the University of Western Ontario. Um, I won an OGS grant at, at one point. So, you know, a lot of this is taxpayer-funded research and to not see it go anywhere, I think is is not really living up to, or at least not really giving much back in terms of what I got um, uh, as I wrote the book. And I mean, I, I did a lot of research travel for this and, you, you know, like I, I, that is something I absolutely enjoyed. Um, and so to, to not have anything to, to give back uh, or to not to put anything back out there after receiving so much support, I think, um, you know, that's something I felt like I needed to pay back. Um, when you mentioned sort of the, the field of military history, I think it's also one of the reasons why I was also wanting to put this out there is because particularly in Canada, there were not a lot of openings for tenure track military historians at um, and so I think it's it's particularly important for scholars. I, I think there's a lot of very interesting work that's being done and that has been done by scholars during the, their graduate studies, whether whether that's while they're writing their master's thesis or while they're writing their, their dissertation. But at the end of the day, like there have been so few jobs for military historians that uh, I don't think many of them have really had the support of post-PhD employment to get their publications out into book form, um, or at least not to, to have second books out. So I think having being able to, to put out a first book and being able to kind of 
inject uh, a new idea into the field um, is particularly important because I think there are, there are so few opportunities for kind of, um, I guess, lifelong careers in, in military history in Canada. So I think, I think there's a, a particular emphasis for PhDs with military history to try to get their, their work out there because like the reality is that I don't think many of us are going to have the opportunity to to write second and third books. Um, so for me, it was it was very much about trying to get this out there and trying to to get these ideas into the field so that others might might consider them in their work. Yeah. So let's get into the specifics of what is in the book. Again, the subtitle is Voluntary sure. Mobilization in Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. So let's start there with those three countries when we're talking about the british empire of course in the 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 start of the 20th century and the beginning days of the first world war of course the empire goes beyond those three countries so what is it about australia canada and new zealand that attracted your attention and why are those three countries of, of all the possibilities the best for a comparative study for this particular book trying to talk about where the idea came from is, is always kind of a long story. I, <laughs> I've been interested in, like, vaguely interested in my undergraduate work about sort of, you know, thinking about how Australia and Canada are, are sort of the same but different um, because I had, I, had done a, I had done some travel in Australia when I was an undergraduate. I visited the Australian War Memorial and I'd seen kind of the parallels between their experience of the First World War and our experience of the war. So uh, when I did my master's at the University of Western Ontario, I, I was kind of angling towards some kind of comparative work. Um, I was uh, studying under Jonathan Vance, and I, I asked him if I could do kind of a directed reading course um, on sort of the, the British dominions that would kind of pave the way for a PhD in this topic. And one of the things that I was really struck with was sort of the the enthusiasm that we see in, in Australia and Canada and New Zealand to support a war that, you know, for all intents and purposes, probably wouldn't have affected them in any real sense. And so I think that was kind of the the guiding question for me is sort of why why are Canada, uh, why are our people in Canada, in Australia, in New Zealand so invested in a war that they're separated, uh, on, uh, that's going on across the ocean, across two oceans or several oceans, I think, if you look at it from the Australian and New Zealand perspective. Why are people so invested and so interested in supporting this war? Um, and then also thinking across lines of race, but also thinking about uh, sort of the, the, you know, we hear some, uh, to a certain extent, about how Indigenous people or Indigenous communities were really interested in, in being part of the war and uh, how how racialized immigrants like uh, you know the Japanese in, in Canada or, or black communities in Canada were really trying to mobilize their own contributions to the war, which considering how the, um, the Dominion governments treated those those communities, it seems a bit odd that they would be so willing to support um, a government or a cause that, that treated them so so poorly, um, and so it was really that was kind of the, the driving question for me is sort of why why was there so much support for this war in contexts that were so far removed from it, um, and I think that's really what what drove my my curiosity as I went forward. Well, so let's let's get into that and and why <laughs> people were so enthused. You know, the the idea that gets presented certainly in a lot of uh, high school courses, uh, if I remember my experience here in Ontario, grade 10 high school, and, you know, I, I have a lot of friends who are teachers who still talk about this, and certainly in undergrad courses as well, the way it gets presented is the war starts, and there's this immediate push of, of people who want to go in and, and enlist in the war, and, you know, with, with greater detail, it often gets presented as these are people who are first-generation British immigrants who who are going to fight because they have that connection over in Great Britain and, and in Europe that they want to go and protect. That, that generally, I think, is how it gets presented as that immediate first wave of, of folks who are enlisting. How accurate is that from your research? Yeah, I, I try not to get too much into the weeds of individual enlistments and how many of them are, are sort of you know, just looking to get uh, a ticket back home. 
Um, you know, I think one of the things I say in my book is, you know, you could you could spend a lifetime trying to dig into all the, the different right. individual <laughs> motivations for yeah. contributing to the war. Um, and so one of the things I steer to in the book is looking at community organizations and how, um, you know, those individual motivations are organized into uh, collective uh, contributions, because that's really where it starts to matter is, you know, if, if a bunch of people want to sign up for different reasons, that's one thing. But the way that those individuals are grouped together into uh, a collective battalion that is, say, a Scottish battalion or an Irish battalion or a Japanese-Canadian battalion, um, that really puts a different inflection on on the, the individual motivation. Um, and, you know, the same thing could be said to, to other forms of voluntary contributions. You know, the reason why an individual throws a couple of coins into a collection box you know, we could spend a lifetime trying to figure out why that happens, but the committee that organizes the collection and that decides what that money is going to go towards and how that contribution is going to be presented to, to, the, to the government for the war effort puts a different inflection on the, the individual motivation. Uh, and that's, that was kind of a big thing that I came across in my research. Uh, and that was kind of a, the first round of research was looking at sort of uh, I guess what you would call sort of Anglophone voluntary societies who, you know, really had a corner on the, the voluntary market and whose whose voices are most preserved in the archives because uh, they are Anglophone middle and upper class men and women who are organizing this, uh, this effort, you know, their voices are most preserved in the archives. So I, I was reading minute books from all these local voluntary committees, like patriotic committees, um, as they were collecting these and trying to figure out what to do. And one of the things that struck out is that there was an intense localism in, in uh, that they were trying to preserve uh, an intensely local identity uh, and that, there, that neighboring efforts often competed uh, in terms of uh, trying to distinguish their efforts from that of the neighboring town. There are arguments that break out between different branches of the, uh, the IOD, the Imperial Order Daughters of the Empire. There's this uh, a, a big spat that breaks out in, in New Brunswick because uh, there's uh, different chapters are, are arguing over sort of who should be in charge of the provincial effort. So there are arguments between sort of neighboring committees. And then when these committees are giving their, they're making their donations to, to the, the departments of defense, there's often some kind of uh, condition that they're attaching to it. So we'll see things like you know, I think there's a there's a committee in Victoria, in the state of Victoria, Australia. They raise enough money that they can purchase an ambulance, and then when they go over to present it to the Defense Department, they'll say, uh, you know, we would like this to serve any unit that supports men from the state of Victoria, and we would like you to put a plaque on there that says donated by the people of Victoria. And so, you know, uh, I think it's interesting. It shows that there's there's a certain level of localism, um, but it also shows kind of the um, the inefficiency of the voluntary system that a lot of these efforts were competing rather than coordinating their efforts uh, and that a lot of the donations that were given over to the government because of the conditions that were attached to it that 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 kind of presented that these local um, these local contributions often complicated things for the departments of defense it's very difficult for the department of defense to say yeah of course we're going to make sure that only people from the state of Victoria, or soldiers from the sort of state of Victoria benefit from this ambulance. I think one of the most absurd conditions that I saw was um, there was a, um, a lawyer from Toronto who wanted, who wanted to donate enough money to purchase a machine gun on the, on the condition that only former members of the Boy Scouts uh, be able to use this machine gun, because I, I guess he used to be a Boy Scout and he wanted to kind of make sure that Boy Scouts in the Army got what they needed. And so to a certain extent, it, it, it gets to be absurd how the, the voluntary nature of, of the, um, the war effort in Australia and Canada and New Zealand, how, how inefficient the system really is in terms of supporting war effort. And I think that's something that uh, scholars of military history might be interested in, in in terms of sort of the mobilizing of the war effort. But I think for, for scholars of Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, I think the, the localism that, that that we see in here tells us a lot about sort of the, um, our, I think it, it, it's one of the defining characteristics of a settler col colony. And to, to kind of make sense of this, I, I ended up 
relying very heavily on the literature of settler colonial studies to make sense of why localism matters so much. And it wasn't really until I started looking across lines of, of race and ethnicity that it really started making more sense that this wasn't just uh, localism or this wasn't just kind of local enthusiasm or local pride, but that there was something else going on that, that kind of spoke to sort of, of ideas of settler autonomy and, and really started fitting into um, the kind of framework that a lot of scholars of settler colonialism apply in, in their research outside of the field of the First World War. And I think, you know, one of the phrases that defines settler colonialism for a lot of people um, is, uh, you know, the, the idea that settler colonialism is um, is a structure, not an event. And so I think if you, if you um, really wish to apply the framework of settler colonialism when studying the history of Australia and Canada and New Zealand, it's important to to you know apply it to, to different aspects of history and so I think one of the things I tried to this book to do in this book is to apply uh, you know settler or colonial framework and understanding how that shaped the way that Australia and Canada and New Zealand mobilized for for the first world war I love the idea though of there being like a battle and this guy is on and they need somebody to run the the gun and they're like were you a boy scout and like, like the the, the idea yeah. of that is so absurd, right? That that that's just not an actual reasonable thing to do in, in sort of practicality when you're on the front lines. But at the same time, as you're talking, I kind of you know, not that I've been involved in a lot of fundraising efforts in my life, but it does seem like just as a general rule, when organizations are trying to raise funds, they seem to make it for specific things that they have a lot more success getting people enthused and, and wanting to participate if it's around a specific thing. Whereas people donating to general funds, uh, it, it doesn't tend to happen, I think, on the same level because people want to target what they're doing so that they know what is going on, right? So I know exactly when I put forward money to something or when I contribute, I know exactly what it's to as opposed to this broad generality of, oh, I'm contributing to the you know, universities do this all the time. They're like, oh, you're helping to build this building or you're, you're giving to this scholarship as opposed to the school at large. So I understand that aspect of it, but it does seem the, the more micro you get, the, the more ridiculous it, it seems. But in reference to settler colonialism, is any part of this, these communities wanting to basically, you know, be the, the chosen community and the example for everybody else and be held up by the government or of, of their respective countries, or even better, maybe the crown itself is as the shining example of what we should be like, like how much of, of that is a factor of just trying to situate themselves as the ideal community within the broader structure of the British Empire. That certainly plays an important role. And I think if we think about settler colonialism, the fact that a lot of these communities are very new um, and, you know, a, a big part of the settler colonial process is kind of taking indigenous land and imposing on it the idea that settlers belong here and that this is now land that belongs to the settlers. And so I think you know, that logic certainly is one of the things that drives the localism to kind of say that this is, you know, this town's effort and that this town is, is doing this thing, it, you know, kind of helps root um, that community in place. Um, so I think that's definitely something that, that is at play here. I think that's one of the things that amplifies the localism in Australia and Canada and New Zealand, but, you know, obviously localism um, takes place everywhere else. I think the other thing that really kind of shows how kind of a settler colonial mindset is at work is when we look at voluntary contributions, what, what particularly stands out is that when we look across lines of race and ethnicity and indigeneity, that um, there is a, 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 a strong reluctance to accept voluntary contributions from, uh, you know, whether they're European uh, immigrants who have arrived in Canada or racialized, more racialized communities like uh, the Japanese in, in British Columbia or, or black communities uh, in Ontario or, um, you know, uh, Chinese migrants in, in, in Australia and New Zealand. There's a very strong reluctance when those communities mobilize and try to, to show that they're a part of this. There's a strong reluctance to, to accept their efforts. 
um, or they're they're kind of downplayed in the press, or when they are um, sort of talked about in the press, it's in ways that are meant to reinforce negative stereotypes, or in some cases, they're there to, to shame white settlers into contributing more money. So, um, you know, there are, there are um, I think this was fairly common in early 20th century newspapers that they would have these kind of humorous vignettes that uh, kind of showed racialized migrants to have certain stereotypes. And those kind of stories appear during the, the, the First World War where there are um, kind of uh, stories of, of workers in Chinese laundries who don't really understand or who are or kind of portrayed as these kind of naive childlike characters who don't really understand the war. But when um, a white woman comes in explaining that she's collecting money for the Red Cross, they all say like, oh, yes, of course, we'll, we'll give you money. And, uh, uh, you know, the way that it's written, um, it has a very strong accent that, you know, it's obviously trying to portray them in, in, a, in, a, in a very stereotypical light. So, uh, you know, the, the contributions from that community are kind of minimized that way. Um, there are kind of, you'll, you'll sometimes see, or see news reports where I think there was a newspaper in Calgary that posted a story saying how um, Chinese miners in Blairmore had raised so much money for the Canadian Patriotic Fund, and then underneath it would say something like, they are wider than some of the people that we know, as if to say, like, uh, you know, if the, if it was kind of a way to shame British Canadians into giving more money, saying that that's how much money the, the Chinese are giving. Shame on you for not giving more. Mm -hmm. um, or I think uh, in an Australian newspaper, they, they presented this uh, this kind of line that's saying, you know, the, the Chinese community of, I think it was of Adelaide, has given so much money, but it was presented in a um, satirical news column called Facts and Rumors, Facts spelled F-A-C-K. So it was kind of a, right. was kind of, put up as a joke. Um, so that's where I think ideas of settler colonialism become a bit more uh, relevant to interpreting the, the First World War. If I, if I only studied white communities, I don't think I ever would have thought outside the idea of localism and, and you know, that this is just kind of boosterism. Um, but I think when I push myself to, to look across lines of, of race and ethnicity um, to see the, how contributions from other communities were uh, were being turned away, it kind of started to fit settler colonial framework a, a little bit more. How much of these programs are happening organically in these communities and, and how much is set up by a, a central organization? I know you talked about how it's very decentralized and, and communities are, are doing this. But with a, a group like the Red Cross, for instance, if people are fundraising for them, is there a central branch that is is fostering this, particularly when we're looking at, the, again, this idea that the war and, and these efforts are being used to to further the colonial project? Is is there some sort of sort of, sort of almost I hate to say like this master plan uh, by central organizations and governments? to really use the war as a way to further the legitimacy of the state and consciously make it so that this is what a proper member or a proper citizen of this country does and looks like. Is it, is it that explicit at a central level in any of these countries? I think this is one of the benefits of looking across different national frameworks. I think you know, in Canada, it remains very decentralized. Um, and, you know, Canada at the time has a conservative government, which I think, you know, was at least at the at the time was, you know, I think we'll, we'll, we'd still call sort of a small government approach. And so, it, it, you know, the, the very self-directed decentralized effort in Canada, you know, Desmond Morton talks about the, uh, the Canadian Patriotic Fund in his book, Fight or Pay. And, you know, as much as there was a national Canadian Patriotic Fund, um, it really was organized along local lines to the extent that no province had kind of a provincial Canadian Patriotic Fund, um, and that a lot of the branches of the Canadian Patriotic Fund uh, that were established in, in the major cities, their aid stopped at the kind of city limits, and so Canadians living in rural communities really kind of had to apply directly to Ottawa. So, you know, there are attempts to make 
kind of a national framework, but in Canada, the government remains very hands off and leaves it to be organic. Um, in Australia, um, there is a, a labor government and a couple of the states have uh, elect labor governments at, at the state level. And in those cases, there are attempts to legislate a more centralized war effort, not necessarily to, to impose settler identity in the way that you're suggesting, but at least to, to rationalize it and try to cut down on this these conditions that money from this town can, can only go to, to soldiers from this town. Um, but there's a lot of pushback from local communities, and there's even in the, the, the states that are most aggressive in trying to force local efforts to conform to a kind of centralized model, those governments ultimately defer to to, to the local efforts. Um, and in some cases, uh, like in Western Australia, for example, there's no real attempt from the state to, to centralize the war effort, but the, the Victoria League, which is you know, tr trying to coordinate an effort for the Trench Comforts Fund, they're trying to, um, I think midway through the war, or the, from the beginning of the war, they're trying to create a centralized fund. And in the boat in 1916, um, they say, all right, let's just let different towns have different funds to, to support their own uh, communities. And what they find is that people end up giving more money because like you said earlier, people are more likely to give money when they know what it's going to. So I think one of the things that we see in, in all three contexts is that there's a strong reluctance to, to kind of interfere with local efforts. And if we if we look at the mobilization efforts in Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, that deference to local authority really stands out from what we see in Europe uh, and in, in the United Kingdom, where because of the intensity of the war and because of um, the, the increasing needs of the war effort, states are imposing their authority on the war effort. And, you know, in, 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 in Europe, you know, the First World War is very much a catalyst to, to, to state building, whereas in Australia and Canada and New Zealand, um, you know, there are certainly elements of the state that, that become stronger, but I, we definitely don't see the attempt to centralize the, the war effort to the same extent. And I think that sets um, Australia, Canada and New Zealand apart in terms of studying how um, societies mobilize for war. I think it makes a good case for showing that um, you know the, the context of Australia and Canada and New Zealand um, leads those societies to mobilize differently uh, for the war effort. So the question, I guess, is, is why um, is it so important for local autonomy? And you know, one of the things that we see, again, uh, looking at Desmond Morton's book, is that um, you know, local communities are able to exercise a lot of power, not just in, in giving their donations to the government, but uh, local patriotic funds Again, as Desmond Morton shows in, in Montreal, they also decide who receives their funds at home. And so we see things like members of the, the, the Canadian Patriotic Fund uh, inspect the homes of wives of soldiers to make sure that they are uh, you know, living up to a certain standard. And I think one of the things that we see from the local, um, or from the, uh, the, the localized organization of collections is that it, it maintains kind of local uh, elites control over their, their communities, um, and so it kind of reinforces that um, that social hierarchy, and that it puts them in the position to um, kind of police the disbursement of uh, relief funds or, or uh, you know separation allowances. Um, so I think that's one of the things that that explains the localism. Um, I think you know when we look at ideas of race, the idea of localism is absolutely one of the things that is end, that ends up uh, reinforcing racial exclusion, um, because uh, uh, if we look at the the attempt to raise um, a contingent of black soldiers in Ontario, there's an attempt in Toronto to to raise uh, a company of, of black soldiers to to kind of have a, a visible contingent within one of the Ontario battalions. Um, when they get to about platoon strength, um, the organizers petition the uh, the the Department of Militia and they say, you know, we have a platoon of soldiers. Would any of the battalions uh, in, in in Ontario, except this platoon. So the the, the commander of the militia district number two, which looks over kind of Toronto and northern Ontario, sends out telegrams to all the different battalions. And a lot of the responses he gets are from battalion commanders that say no, because this is this battalion is going to represent this town, and uh, you know that is code for you know there are only 
we are only going to accept white recruits. And, and one of them absolutely said, you know, there are no, this is absolutely a battalion from this town. There are no black people in this town. And therefore, we are not accepting this. Uh, you know, we will, we will not want uh, recruits from this, this platoon. Um, and so localism becomes a way of reinforcing kind of that becomes the, the, the method through which there is a kind of attempt to impose the idea of, you know, what is a settler and who belongs to the war effort. Um, as long as it's a local war effort, it lets the, the kind of local organizers define who's in, who's out. And ultimately, um, it, it becomes a way of excluding non-white uh, participation from the war. Uh, and it saves the, the, um, the Dominion governments from having to pass any kind of explicitly restrictive language that, that uh, within their defense acts. Although Australia does have racially explicit language barring non-Europeans from the defense forces, um, there are attempts by Chinese Australians to enlist. And again, that localism comes into play where uh, you know, Chinese Australians will write letters to the editor in newspapers and say, like, you know, this is ridiculous. Why, why can't I enlist? And then somebody will write back saying, oh, try, try enlisting in this town because they're a bit more permissive. Um, and so again, the the, um, the decentralized effort becomes a way that boundaries of race are kind of reinforced and to to a certain extent and permeated because there's so many differences between the way that uh, local efforts are organized. So yeah, I think one of the ways in which the kind of idea of like what is a settler or what what is kind of the ideal version of the settler is not being done at the state level, it's being done more so at the local level. And I think again, that's one of the the things that drives the localism so much. Yeah, and you kind of see it even in the post-war years where each community wants to have or feels as though it needs to have its own war memorial. And mm -hmm. there's this massive push across the country and every small town pretty much puts up a war memorial while at the same time you do see the, the push of the Canadian clubs mm -hmm. in, in this country that these national groups, this, this patriotism, this nationalism that comes out of the war, but the people who tend to be leading those groups are people who participated in the war effort in some way, and they're taking that same localism to a national level. And so you see the same types of exclusion in the years after the war that is based essentially on some of this, the same local settler ideals that you're talking about in the voluntary mobilization during the war. It, it sort of builds on itself in the years after the war. And it creates this, this interesting idea where, you know, you have these various identities, right? Nobody has a singular identity that, that's really hard for, for anyone to have. So, you know, you have a, a push here, like one of the examples in the book is, if you are of Welsh descent and live in Vancouver, are you doing things for soldiers from Vancouver or Welsh soldiers in the British Army? Like, where is that identity? And this local exclusion seems to be a method through which, even indirectly, you get people identifying more with their communities and therefore with the indirectly the Canadian state as opposed to potentially whatever their other forms of identity are. And I mean, again, like kind of tying into what I was saying earlier about sort of settler communities rooting themselves in place, local exclusion helps to kind of displace racialized immigrants. And yep. so, you know, we have a very prominent example in British Columbia where uh, the Japanese community, and, and there's a lot of debate within the, the Japanese community of Vancouver over whether they, they should try to, to raise their own battalion, but um, the Japanese Canadian club uh, ends up, um, you know, essentially turning their clubhouse into a barracks. They, they, they. Um, I don't know if they, we can say the word recruit, but they, they enlist about 200 volunteers. They hire a, a former sergeant major from the British Army to to train them in drill, uh, and then they approach the, the, um, the local commander of the militia district, saying like, you know, we have this core uh, of recruits who are trained and ready to go. Would you let us raise our own battalion? Um, and the um, the local commander of the, the British Columbia's military district was, I think, quite uh, quite racist and made it clear uh, to his uh, battalion commanders across British Columbia not to accept Asian Canadians. 
And so, um, you know, the effort by the Japanese comp was absolutely thrown out by, by you know, Colonel uh, Duff Stewart, who, who was the general officer commanding in, in British Columbia. And, and so what ends up happening is that, you know, these, these 200 volunteers have to travel to, Al to Alberta to enlist. And so, you know, the first thing that they do is they, they petition the general officer commanding of the Alberta Militia District saying, you know, we have 200 volunteers, would you accept them? And when that gets passed up to the Department of Militia, um, the Department of Militia insists that no one accept a draft of larger than 50 uh, Japanese Canadians to kind of break them up. So there's this kind of effort to dilute uh, the contribution of Japanese Canadians among different battalions. Um, but ultimately what happens is that, you know, if Japanese Canadians in British Columbia or Vancouver want to enlist, they have to go to Alberta to do so. And this is where the idea of local commemoration kind of reinforces that division because the, the units that they fought with build memorials in Alberta and yet they return to Vancouver. And so what happens, uh, you know, as, as uh, anyone who's gone to, to Stanley Park knows that they, that the Japanese community have to, to build their own memorial in Stanley Park, um, but all the units that they fought with are, are in Alberta. And so we can see how, you know, local exclusion, even if, if they're accepted in, in Alberta, helps kind of displace or, uh, and, and uh, uproot the, uh, the Japanese contribution to the war effort because they're not part of the local war effort. And ultimately in Canada and in Australia and New Zealand, um, it is primarily the local, the, 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 the war is often commemorated through a local lens. And so excluding them from the local war effort effectively keeps them out of, of this, this narrative that is ultimately a nation building narrative. That's really interesting to to think about it in that way, right? The, again, sort of the idea of who's allowed and who's not allowed, and the legitimacy that comes from this is is really striking and has long lasting effects. Because you know these memorials, even if they're even if people aren't consciously consuming them, they're signs of you know who who is allowed to to identify as being from this place. And that exclusion has long-term impacts in communities all across the country. Because as I said, every community in the country has one. I think, again, like one of the things that really helped make the case that settler, the, the framework of settler colonialism should be applied to the study of, of the First World War in Australia and Canada and New Zealand is the difference between the exclusion of, of racialized immigrants such as uh, you know, Asian immigrants and, and um, um, kind of the black diaspora in Canada is the contrast between that and sort of more encouraging approach to the mobilization of, the, of indigenous people, because one of the things that comes out in the, um, in the, 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 the records of the departments of defense is that a lot of the, the, a lot of the rationale for enlisting indigenous soldiers during the First World War is being made through the framework of assimilation there's a lot of crossover between the, the Department of Indian Affairs in Canada and the Militia Department in that a lot of Indian agents end up commissioning as officers and a lot of them try to recruit uh, Indigenous soldiers because they believe that military service is going to extend the work of residential schools. And there is, there is a, a letter that I've come across that kind of you know, says very explicitly, you know, I believe this is going to do more than all the residential schools in the country. And so... We can very much see how settler colonial ideas of race, of both you know, exclusion, which mirrors kind of the racially exclusive immigration policies that are meant to keep the settler colonial colonies white, is being applied to recruiting practices. But at the same time, we also see how the assimilationist policies that are meant to kind of erase indigenous peoples and effectively attempt to turn them white um, is also being uh, reflected in, in recruiting practices. So we very much see how the settler colonial framework is, is reflected in, in, re in recruiting efforts, um, both in, you know, again in Canada, in Australia, and in New Zealand. It's usually tied up in the idea that this is going to be strong contrib contribution to uh, the assimilative um, work of residential schools or industrial schools in Australia. A lot there, uh, really great stuff, and really because of that, just more reasons for people to go and pick up the book. Again, the title is For Home and Empire Voluntary Mobilization in Australia, Canada, and New Zealand During the First World War. Steve Marty, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about the book. Where can people find it if they're looking for it? Oh, um, I mean, I think uh, just ordering it through UBC Press.
Yeah, so yeah, it's from our friends over at UBC Press. Paperback is out, which is always exciting on academic press publications, I have to say. <laughs> When when the yeah, paperback no, comes out, it becomes it becomes just a little more uh, accessible. Let's say, I think a lot more accessible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so uh, so paperbacks out also available EPUB and uh, PDF if you want to order those as well. So Steve Marty, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me. So there you have it, my discussion with Steve Marty. And again, the book is for Home and Empire: Voluntary Mobilization in Australia, Canada, and New Zealand during the First World War. And I thank Steve for his time and our friends at UBC Press as well. So that'll do it for this week. Thank you for listening. If you have not yet, please do subscribe to the show wherever it is you get your podcast. Do the likes, the ratings, the comments, all that kind of stuff helps keep the show going, helps other people find the show. And if you like this one, go back into the archive. We've done a bunch. We're doing weekly with a couple exceptions during the pandemic, and we'll try to keep that going once we get into the fall, assuming that things don't go back to normal. Uh, but for as long as the pandemic is in place, the plan is to go weekly. So head back, find some of the other episodes. We've done some really fun stuff, uh, some interesting stuff since the uh, end of March when we started doing this. So also head over to activehistory.ca, some great material over there. We're keeping that moving, keeping that rolling. Tons of uh, interesting material. Some of it is pandemic related, some of it's not. Got some good stuff about teaching as well so head over to activehistory.ca and check out all the work being done over there so that'll do it for this week if you have any thoughts about what you'd like to hear on the show do get in touch historyslam at gmail.com you can find me on twitter at the sean graham so until we talk again if you're out and you see enrico palazzo please say hi for me Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.